Now that we have a good definition of boundary point to work with, it sets up a spectrum for us, which on one end are the open sets. Open sets are going to be those that contain no boundary points, sets that are disjoint from their boundaries. And on the other end are the sets whose boundaries are subsets of them, sets that contain their boundaries. So let me get this straight. You went through all of that work just to prove to me that a closed set contains its endpoints. I already knew that. End no, no, point. see, it, there's so much more to it than that. I mean, it's not about endpoints. That was the whole point of the previous video. It's about boundary points. Say it with me. Boundary. Boundary. Endpoint. Boundary. Endpoint. B O U N D. Look, if you uh, haven't grasped the distinction and why it's important by now, then this is might be the video for you. So in this video, we're going to figure out why endpoint is such an insufficient notion to capture what we're trying to capture about the boundary of a set. And to do that, we're going to introduce a type of point which makes that distinction very clear for us. It's an accumulation point of a set. And it's going to be the accumulation points that we're going to use to get our sort of most usable definition of what it's going to mean to be a closed set. Accumulation points are not the same thing as endpoints. They capture the idea of boundary in the intuitive way that you're probably thinking of, right? It captures this idea that I'm right at the edge of a set and there's a lot of set on one side of me, but then there's no set on the other side of me. Um, so that's going to be the idea of an accumulation point, perhaps. Um, so watch this video. Maybe this is going to be what it takes to get you off of this endpoint idea once and for all. Deal? All right. But get to the point already, will you? This is YouTube. My attention is only good for another 83 seconds. It's probably going to make me watch 15 more minutes of this stuff. All right. So in this video, let's do it. Let's figure out what an accumulation point is and why it, it convinces us once and for all that containing our endpoints is not really enough in order to contain all of our boundary. So let's again start with a randomly chosen subset of the real numbers. Maybe it looks like this. What would the boundary points be? Well, according to our previous video, we figured out that the set that's sort of sketched here, which consists of an open interval, union together with uh, an isolated point right here, union together with an infinite closed interval, that there are four points in the real number system which qualify as boundary points. So the boundary of A is those four points. But some boundary points are qualitatively different than others. Some boundary points really are kind of on the edge of A. Some boundary points cannot distance themselves from the other elements of A in any meaningful way. Like this one right here, right? It's not possible to shake the other points of A, right? No matter how short that I reach out, I'm always going to be touching other points of A. So there's like, you know, clinging to me like face huggers from the movie Aliens, right? Um, so those points are different than the boundary points that have more personal space, uh, bounded away from the rest of A. These, as you'll remember, are the isolated points, like this one here in the middle. And so what we want is to be able to distinguish between these two qualitatively different kinds of boundary points. And so that's where we're going to make the claim that every isolated point of a set, like this one right here, isolated points automatically get to be boundary points. So I can't be an isolated point of A without being a boundary point of A. And so in that respect, it makes the isolated points kind of less interesting when it comes to figuring out what the boundary of a set is. So then how do we qualitatively describe the different kinds of boundary points? What do all of the non-isolated boundary points have in common? So to be a boundary point of A that might not be an element of A, recall that the reason that isolated points automatically get to be boundary points, but you know we sort of are going to pick them up in the boundary, is that they belonged to A in the first place. But those points which are not isolated and yet are still boundaries, like this point right here, this was not an original point of the set A, and yet it was a boundary point of A. And so in order to be a boundary point that might not have been an element of A in the first place, we need to be able to have this property that no matter how short our arms are, we can reach other points of A within our arm's length. And so this is going to be our operational definition. To be a boundary point of A that might have come from outside of the set, 
we need to have points of A within an epsilon's reach no matter how short our epsilon arms happen to be. And if we are one of those points, then we're going to call ourselves an accumulation point of the set A. So if A is a real subset and X is a real number, X is an accumulation point of A if, no matter how short my arms are for all epsilons greater than zero, there are points of A within an epsilon's reach of me. So there is a point Y that is part of the intersection between my epsilon neighborhood, my arm's reach, and the set A. So is this a good enough definition for what it means to be an accumulation point? Well, I claim that it still needs a little bit of work. Because this definition, as it's written so far over here, doesn't adequately distinguish between the non-isolated boundary points that we want to include in this definition and the isolated points that we don't want to include. After all, if I'm this isolated point here in the middle, do my epsilon arms reach a point y which belongs to the set A? Unfortunately, they still do. And the reason that they still reach a point y which belongs to the intersection of every one of my epsilon neighborhoods and the set A is that my epsilon arms happen to reach myself. And so if x is equal to y, then we will have y within every epsilon neighborhood of myself that also is an element of A. Because remember, if I'm an isolated point of A, I belong to A. And so can my epsilon arms reach a point of A? Sure, they can reach myself. So we want to rule that uh, case out. We want to insist that our epsilon arms not just reach a point of A, we want them to reach a different point of A, distinct from myself. So to do that, we're just going to explicitly rule out the case where x is equal to y. We want to have points other than ourselves, which are elements of A and are within every arm's reach of myself. So an accumulation point is a real number for which every epsilon neighborhood of that real number has a point y which is different from x, different from the center point of my neighborhood, and which belongs to the set A. There's going to be our definition for accumulation point. So just to drive home the distinction, what would the set of all accumulation points for the set A look like? If we agree that sort of qualitatively these on the edge style boundary points should be accumulation points of A, and that this isolated point here should not be an accumulation point of A, well, what else gets to be an accumulation point of A? There's a lot more to it than just these three points. There are a lot more points of a set in general other than these boundary points that get to be accumulation points. After all, what other points have the property that there are other points of A within every epsilon's reach? Well, interior points satisfy that definition. Every interior point of a set is going to have a ton of neighbors around it because the epsilon ball around it is going to be entirely a set of A. Not only can it reach a point of A within every epsilon neighborhood different from itself, everything that it can reach within some epsilon's neighborhood is going to be uh, an element of the set A. And so this sort of sets up the claim that every interior point of a set is automatically going to qualify as an accumulation point. So not only do the accumulation points contain those edges of the sets, they also contain all of the interior of a set. And so to prove this, let's prove it by contraposition. Let's suppose that x is not an accumulation point of A. We'll turn this definition inside out to see how to use it. X is not an accumulation point of A if there exists a positive epsilon, if there is some small distance that I can reach out, such that for all elements Y in the set A, one or the other of these things must be true. Either Y is equal to X, or Y is outside of the intersection of the epsilon neighborhood with A. So to use this in a proof, we're going to use what we sometimes call a disjunctive syllogism for feeling fancy. We're trying to prove an or statement is true over here. We're trying to use an or statement. And so to use an or statement, sometimes what we do is say, well, if one of these clauses doesn't hold, then the other one must hold. Right? In order for an or statement to be true, at least one of the two clauses in that statement have to be true. So to set up a disjunctive syllogism, let's assume for the moment that the second clause holds, right? The, and the second clause was that y doesn't belong to the intersection. So supposing that y does belong to the intersection, that must imply then that the other clause of my or statement was true. Now, in other words, that y is equal to x. So another way to say this is, if there is any point in the intersection of my epsilon neighborhood with a, then that point must be myself. So if x is not an accumulation point of a, then that means that the intersection of my epsilon, one of my epsilon balls uh, with a consists only of the point x. 
but that can only happen if x is an element of a in the first place. And so in one, on the one hand, either x satisfies this definition, if x belongs to a, then x is an isolated point of a. On the other hand, if x doesn't belong to a, then the other possibility is that, well, we actually can't have, uh, we can't have the other possibility be true, but we could have both of these clauses be true. And if both of these clauses is true, that, um, that every point y, which is a part of the set a, uh, but is not a part of the epsilon ball, must be equal to x, what this must mean in this situation, um, because we know for sure that x always belongs to its own epsilon neighborhood. And so the only way for this not to happen is for x to have been an element of a in the first place. So in other words, when we turn this definition inside out and say x is not an accumulation point of a, there's only two possibilities. If x belongs to a, then it must be isolated within a. But if x doesn't belong to a, then that's the only other way that x can be an accumulation, x cannot be an accumulation point of a. So the, that's, the, that's how we do this. So in either of these two cases, if x is not an element of a, we know for sure that x cannot be an interior point of a. Because interior points, by definition, they have to be points of the set in the first place. And on the other hand, if x does belong to a, then x must be isolated within a. And when we introduced isolated points, we made the case, I think convincingly, that isolated points cannot be interior points either. So in either one of these two cases, x is not an interior point of A. And if we read this uh, claim from beginning to end, if x, is an, if x is not an accumulation point of A, then x cannot be an interior point of A. And that's the contrapositive of the equivalent statement that if x is an interior point of A, then it must be an accumulation point. So all the interior points are accumulation points. And so the set of all accumulation points for us, this particular set A looks like this. It includes all the interiors, so these shaded regions here. It also included these three points, which were on the sort of, uh, well, I'll use the word end points, if you like, uh, of these shaded intervals right there. But it doesn't, again, include this in, uh, isolated point from the middle. The set of all accumulation points of a set we call the derived set of A. All right, last but wait for this video, and then I promise we'll, we'll wrap this up. In this example, we don't have a nice relationship between the original set A and the set of A's accumulation points. On the one hand, A is not a subset of the derived set of A, because some points of A were not accumulation points of A. I'm thinking of this isolated point here in the middle. So A is not a subset of its derived set. But then conversely, the derived set was not a subset of A either because there were accumulation points of A that came from outside of A. That's why we started doing this in the first place. We wanted a definition that could get us boundary points that come from outside of the set. And so this subset inclusion doesn't go either way in general. In general, A is not a subset of its derived set, and its derived set is not a subset of it. So we want a little bit nicer notion that does have a clear subset relationship with A. So what we do is we just want to sort of smush all of A and its accumulation points together to get a new set, which is going to always contain A as a subset, a new set of which A will always be a subset and which contains all of A's accumulation points. So this new set we call the closure of A. The closure of A is sort of the smallest superset of A, the smallest set that contains A as a subset and which also contains the accumulation points of A as a subset. And so to get that, we just use the one construction in set theory that gives us the smallest superset of which two things are both subsets. We take the union. So the closure of A is the union of A and its derived set. So we take A, we take all of the accumulation points of A, we make one big happy family with them, and we get the closure of the set A, for which we'll either use CL as notation, or I prefer just to draw a line over A to denote the closure of A. So it's the union of A with its derived set. So just to kind of tie a bow around this discussion that we've been having about the different types of topological points uh, in a set, we have on the one hand interior points of A and isolated points of A. Interior and isolated points of A have to be elements of A in the first place. And then in the last couple of videos, we've also gotten notions of accumulation points of A and boundary points of A. Some of those come from A, some of those come from outside of A, the complement. 
But we also have some nice relationships between these. We know, for example, that every interior point gets to be an accumulation point of A. Every isolated point gets to be a boundary point. But this diagram's a little bit not accurate yet because boundary points can also be accumulation points. I'm thinking about this point right here of this set. So we also need a little bit of overlap. The accumulation points are what we defined in this video to capture the idea of the boundary points of A which are not isolated in A. Right? And so this is the kind of Venn diagram for what we're looking for. And we find the interior of A, which is an open set consisting of all the interior points of A, kind of here in the middle, inside of A. It's a subset, it's an open subset of A. Right? And it consists of A after we have removed all of the boundary points from A. If we suck all the boundary points out of A, then we get the interior of A, which is an open subset in A. Think of it as A, subtract its boundary. On the other hand, we've just been introduced to the closure of A, which is a superset of A. A is a subset of its closure. And the closure consists of A taken together with its accumulation points. So we make A potentially just a little bit larger. And the reason we do that is we want to include all of the boundary points of A so that we can get something that we want to identify as a closed set. If we take A union together with its boundary, as we're going to see in the next video, to union a set with its boundary is the same thing as to union it together with its accumulation points. But the result, the closure of a set, is always a closed set. That's how we're going to want to recognize it. So what we have is the spectrum I talked about at the beginning of this video. Most sets include some of their boundary points, but not all of them, generally. But if we suck all the boundary points away from A, then what we get is an open subset of A. It's the largest open subset of A, the interior. On the other hand, if we complete the picture and include all boundary points of A and throw them in together with A, we get the closure of A, which is the smallest closed superset of A. So this is the spectrum between open and closed in terms of what contain, uh, how much of the boundary points are contained. So in the next video, we're finally going to write down this definition of closed set and then use it to prove some topological properties as well.